Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us at the Center for Japanese Studies noon lecture today. My name is Yuki Shiraido, uh, Assistant Professor of Political Science and Associate Director of CJS, and I am the host today. Before introducing our speaker, uh, let me make an announcement about our next CJS lecture. Next week, Thursday, October 14, Professor Jill Steele at Doshisha University, Japan, will give a lecture titled Gender and Voting Preferences in Japan, Britain, and the United States. Please note the start time of this lecture will be 7 p.m. on Thursday, Eastern Time, 8 a.m. on Friday, Japan Time. Please check out the UMCJS events page as to how to sign up. Now, let me introduce Professor Yoko Okuyama at Uppsala University, Sweden. Uh, Professor Okuyama received her BA in economics from the University of Tokyo in 2012 and PhD in economics from Yale University in 2020, then started her current position. She is a rising star in labor economics and political economy setting Japan on topics particularly relating to gender and socio-political participation. She has multiple papers on gender representation and political institutions, one of which uh, will be presented today. She also have a couple of publications, uh, one of which is in PLOS One. In this webinar, Attendee webcams and microphones have been muted, but we invite you to use the Q&A function to submit any questions you have. You can submit your questions anytime, even during the, the lecture and after Professor Okuyama's presentation. Uh, uh, I will ask her your questions as time, as many questions as time permits. Okay. Uh, with all that, uh, please join me welcoming Professor Okuyama, and uh, Yoko's screen is yours. Great, thank you so much, uh, Yuki, for a very generous introduction, and thank you so much for all to come to my talk. So let me share my screen first here all right so okay i hope everyone can see my slides in first screen so again thank you so much for having me in this wonderful lecture series and today i'll be talking about my empirical research on the impact of women's radio programs in occupied japan so this year is a perfect year to talk about this topic because 2021 marks 75 years since Japanese women voted for the first time. So let me warm up my talk by showing you the percentage of women in the national legislature in each country since 1945. So here I have a percentage of women in either in the national legislature or in the lower house and the green line at the bottom shows the number for japan and as a comparison i have the united states in pink and the blue in sweden the country that i am now and the black dotted line is the world average so clearly japan unfortunately lags behind in terms of women representation in politics today However, when we look back and zoom into the period right after World War II, we see that even in Japan, women's share was as high as what Sweden had. And so this really drew my attention on what was happening or what was happening to the women's empowerment during the American occupation. And this is the time period that I'm looking at today. And in particular, I'll be looking at women's radio programs or radio programs that are targeting female listeners during the American occupation. So the background is when Japan was occupied by the Allied powers, 
empowering women was one of the core occupation policies. And they used radio to disseminate the idea of gender equity and really try to dismantle the pre-existing patriarchal norms. And so as far as I know, this is one of the earliest examples in the world to use mass media at a large scale to disseminate this our idea of gender equity and really promote gender um, parity. And so that raises a question of whether this was actually effective and how it changed women's outcomes. So this is the question that I'm answering in this study. And so just to give you a summary of this paper, I start off by collecting the textual content of radio programs and analyze what kind of content was on air. I uncovered that together with the historian's accounts that women's radio programs really aim to dismantle the pre-existing patriarchal gender norms and I'll show you uh, some examples in a moment. Also, they aired voices of the silenced women before World War II, and especially the birth control activists in pre-war Japan. Moreover, based on my text analysis of radio content, I find, I find that the women's radio programs covered a range of topics from women's role in democracy, women's career and family, or health benefit or birth spacing and birth control, and, and finally, um, <clears throat> freedom of choosing a marriage partner. And so this must have been very progressive compared to the status quo women's role in Japan. So that motivated me to examine the causal impact of the exposure to women's radio programs on their political participation, employment, marriage and fertility patterns. And identifying the causal impact is challenging because the causal relationship between radio listenership and listeners behavior can go both ways. What I mean by that is instead of radio affecting our behavior, it could be the case that women who were planning to vote were listening to radio because they wanted to collect information. And so in order to address this challenge, I utilized the data on radio signal strength at each location and uh, I employed the, what we call the instrumental variable strategy in my regression analysis. And in a nutshell, I compare women who happen to have better radio signal and women who happen to have worse signal. This by accident difference in radio signal resulted in the difference in radio listenership or the degree to which they listen to radio. And then that further resulted in their behavioral difference, like difference in electoral turnout. And so by doing this, I was able to elicit the uh, causal impact. And I, I hope to convince you that this was a plausible way to, to look at it. To preview my findings, I do find that in areas with greater radio exposure, women's turnout was higher. And because men's turnout didn't change, so that effectively closed the gender gap in, in turnout in the, in the 1946 election. And also moreover, in areas with greater radio exposure, female candidate gained more votes. And it was instrumental to push up women's representation in the, in the House of Representatives. And so that's what exactly what I showed you in the motivating graph. In the meantime, I did not find any impact either in the labor market or marriage pattern, but I do find 
that in areas with greater radio exposure, fertility decline was accelerated. So this has an important implication for the women's autonomy over their bodies, as well as uh, it, it implies that women's empowerment, well, empowering women played one of the key roles for Japanese fertility transition. And all in all, this radio policy was effective, at least in the short run. And if time allows, I'd be uh, more than happy to discuss what was the long-term consequence. Okay, so I actually want to jump in. So I'm going to talk about a historical background, then illustrate my empirical framework, and then finally show you findings. And so some of you in the audience might be our experts in this uh, time period, but nonetheless, let me uh, share some key points that are, that are necessary to understand my paper. So Japan was occupied by the Allied powers between 45 and 52. And as I said in the introduction, raising women's legal and social status was, a, was one of the five core policies. And, and then you might ask like, so why is it? Like, why were they interested in empowering women in Japan? And so my reading of the historical accounts is that the primary aim was for peace building, uh, but not necessarily for women's sake. But, but I see that there are some American female officers who were intrinsically motivated to empower Japanese women. And they played a key role even behind the women's radio programs. So the Allied powers knew that radio was really an effective way to disseminate uh, their ideas. So they started women's radio programs as early as October 1st, 1945, and they continued throughout the occupation. So women's radio programs were called uh, Fujin. Okay, now, today but it was under the very close supervision of, uh, of SCAP. Okay. Um, and so, and there was no, um, I see that my connection is unstable, but I hope everyone is hearing me. But anyway, so there was no private radio channel. So there was only uh, JBC at the time. And the JBC allocated multiple times, time slots per day for Fujimuti or women's radio programs. And the flagship program was called Women's Hour, or uh, in Japanese, Fujin no Jikan. It drew a uh, women's high listenership, even though it is quite progressive, as I show you in a moment. And uh, importantly, men didn't listen to, um, according to the JBC survey. Okay, so let me just show you some examples for the radio content that I drew from GHQ SCAP weekly radio reports. So this, um, for example, on March 12th, 1946, Women's Hour was talking about the upcoming election. Election was on um, was in April, so it's like one month before the election. And on this date, the speaker was really urging women to make her own decision for their vote instead of following their husbands, and really trying to challenge the notion that women have to obey their um, their men. Um, by the way, this, this document was written in English, so this is the original text. 
And also on December 7th, 1950, this is a bit later in, in the occupation period. On that day, they were talking about the birth control. And one of the speakers was Kato Shizue. She was a birth control activist in Prio, Japan, but she was forced to close her clinic by the government. And so I think it was pretty big change that she was able to speak about birth control on air through public radio. And so this really uh, tells us that how the public discourse around women's role and what women can do changed. And so this document or this reports are really fascinating documents to read. I have five years of reports and I can spend hours and hours, but I, I cannot fit into this lecture. So instead what I did was to classify this daily content into seven topics using um, uh, using text um, text analysis model like latent delicy allocation. So I don't go into the technical details, but this is the way to categorize text into topics uh, using uh, unsupervised machine learning. And I chose the number of topics, but even even if we change number of topics my main message doesn't change. So here is the topic composition of, among the women's radio programs over time. And in the figure at the top, in, I have the politics portion. This is the topics that we're talking about elections, democracy, and politics in general. And we clearly see that in 1946, the majority of the time spent was spent on politic, political topics. But um, over time, the topic composition became more diverse, uh, including employment or food health and, and uh, about something about children and mothers, et cetera, et cetera. So motivated by this, as well as the data availability, I examined not only the effect of radio on women's political participation, but also on employment, marriage, and fertility patterns. Okay. So with that, I wanna illustrate my regression analysis. So here I have the regression framework, just like regress outcomes on the radio exposure. And I measure the degree to which women were exposed to radio by the share of households in each district J that were subscribing to radio. A district is she or gun in Japanese which is a bit larger than villages, like a collection of villages. And because the radio was a licensing system, so there's a very detailed record on how many households were subscribing to radio in, uh, in each district. And that was published by the Japan Broadcasting Corporation in 1946. And so you see the distribution uh, of the, of the uh, radio subscription here in a map. As I already mentioned in the introduction, this beta one, this is supposed to capture the causal effect of radio exposure on women's outcomes. This can be biased because of the reverse causality. And, and so the idea is to use the data on the radio signal. This was an AM radio. So the radio signal transmits through the ground during the day and the radio signal, uh, the strength of the radio signal was uh, determined by the distance to the transmitter transmission power, transmission frequency, and 
the soil conditions between a transmitter and potential receivers. So I use this, uh, I use this knowledge and I basically compare women who happen to be in the district with a better signal due to the better soil conditions versus women in a district with worse signal because of the worse soil conditions. And this by accident difference in radio signal due to the soil conditions results in the difference in radio subscription and that leads to difference in women's outcomes. And this is really the logic behind uh, my instrumental variable strategy. And I also checked that this uh, by accident difference in uh, radio signal was not correlated with any pre-occupation uh, characteristics of a district. So the question was then like, how can I get the signal strength? So these days, if economists work on the radio, um, the impact of the radio, we usually use this radio propagation model, which is an engineering model to back up the strength of the radio signal. But, um, but that has a, a slight, slightly, uh, that's a little bit difficult for historical context because the kind of modern or the current situation for the radio propagation and uh, radio propagation in 75 years ago can be different. So instead, I use a map on the radio signal strength that was fortunately published during the American occupation. And here, uh, here is uh, the original map and I digitized it. And according to the NHK Museum, this was published in 1949, but the measurement of the radio signal at each location started way earlier. So I digitized this map to use uh, my statistical analysis. So I'd be happy to talk about the technical aspect of my analysis in the discussion phase, but let me move on. And so in my regression, I also control for the district industrial composition, number of households, number of households per square kilometers, pre prefecture fixed effects, city indicator, a proxy for World War II damage and pre-war outcomes. So basically, I'm, I was trying to compare observably similar districts but just they happen to have different radio signal. And to close this, close this section, here is a list of data that I collected and digitized. And most of them are governmental reports or reports by the Japanese Broadcasting Corporation. But one thing that I wanted to mention was the electoral turnout by gender and district was really hard data to get. And newspapers were the only sources. So I went through all the newspapers that were archived in the National Di Library in Tokyo, as well as in the East Asian Library at Harvard University, and I checked whether they reported the electoral turnouts by gender. And I ended up having data for 26 prefectures. So that covers roughly half of the nation. Luckily, there is no difference between the prefectures in my sample and outside of my sample in terms of radio exposure and the signal strength. So the selection is not so, um, not, not so a big deal. But I, I just mentioned that my, my, um, my data, the prefectures in my data are a slightly more agricultural. Okay, so finally, I can show you some findings 
here on the left, I have a map on the distribution, spatial distribution of radio signal after controlling for the distance to the transmitter and uh, transmission power and transmission frequency. So this is basically the variation in the radio signal coming only from the ground conditions or soil conditions. And it looks like uh, pretty random. And this is the variation that I'm using for, for my causal analysis. And on the right, I have a bin scatter plot of the radio subscription at each district on the uh, radio signal strength. Again, after controlling for the distance to the transmitter and transmitter fixed effects. So basically, um, and then we, we see that even after controlling for the distance, meaning that I'm comparing two districts equidistant from the same transmitter, but still there is a positive relations between the signal strength and the radio subscription. And this is exactly what I wanted. And so better signal encourages people to have radio sets more. So that was uh, first stage in the, in the uh, IV in instrument of variable regression. So let me show you the result. Here I have my result on the turnout in 1946. Zooming into the column five, it says when radio subscription rate in a district increases by one standard deviation unit, women's turnout increased by 2.3 percentage points. And that was statistically significant. Looking at column seven, um, this is about men's turnout, and it's a bit noisy, but we, I don't have find any statistically significant impact. As a result, looking at column eight, women's share among voters who voted increased when the radio subscription rate was higher. That means that more women's voice were in their votes uh, in the 1946 election when they were empowered by the radio. I think I can talk about this slide. So, and I did a bit more um, in-depth analysis and I find that the impact of the radio was larger in the areas where men were scarce or um, male to female ratio was uh, was lower. So I just um, interact the male to female ratio in a district and the radio subscription. And I see that uh, the women's radio programs impact differs based on the male to female ratio. And this is in line with um, critical mass or ma male backlash theory in the sense that acting on the new norms or new ideologies or, um, or not, I shouldn't say ideology, but progressive role of women should be less costly when there is a res less risk of being retaliated in, in the area. So that's my interpretation. And um, lastly, I also look at what happened to female candidates who run in the district where women voters were exposed to radio. So when a district was more exposed to the radio, female candidate also gained more vote and that was by 1.6 percentage point. So, and I'll show you how large it was in the context. But in any case, based on my regression analysis, the radio intervention or radio policy was, uh, was very effective. And that was 
in line with what the SCAP radio report left. So they said in their report that women's radio programs undoubtedly contributed in, in the uh, large turnout. And, and if we look at New York Times, they, people were pretty surprised that a lot of women actually came to vote in, in the first election in 1946. So basically my empirical findings are given the empirical support for, the, for, the, for this claim. Okay. And, um, and also uh, there are more couple, a few, few words for this. So although I analyzed extensively on, uh, on the 1946 election, uh, partly because of the data limitation. But I, if I look at like 1950 election, women's turnout kept increasing. So this, this wasn't really a one-time uh, one effect. Turning to the women's representation in the House of Representatives, if I do a back of the envelope calculation by setting all the radio exposure to be zero and recalculate the election outcome, women's share at the House of Representatives would have been 4.2% in the absence of the radio compared to the actual, actual share of 8.2%. 8 so 4.2% is not an unrealistic percentage because after, uh, after the American occupation, women's share at the diet were, have, were, were like around 3% for a long time in Japan. So it's actually a realistic number. But I can also say based on my analysis that this disseminating new ideas through radio was really a big push. However, I do have some qualitative narratives or evidence that uh, there was some backlash. For example, uh, General MacArthur warned female parliamentarians from forming a female bloc. So I think there was some fear to have uh, many women in the diet. And also there was an electoral reform in 1947 and although the main purpose of the electoral reform wasn't really discourage women, but nonetheless, some politicians knew that it was gonna be very detrimental for women's representation. Um, and I can see it from the diet minutes, but nonetheless it happened. And as they expected, women's share dropped and, and just uh, stuck at the very low level later. So maybe that was the cost of having a big push in, in the uh, very early stage of the uh, gender equity. Okay, so that was the political part. Now I wanna sh shift our attention to other dimensions of women's lives. And um, I actually wanna talk more about fertility, but here quickly I have our, results for women's employment. Basically, I do not have, find any impact. So, and also I didn't find any impact of radio or marriage pattern. But um, what I do find in um, for fertility transition was I thought interesting. So here on the left, I have the average live average number of live births at each district and i split the sample into three groups districts with high exposure to radio uh, medium exposure and low exposure and uh, plot them in the figure as you can see in 1935 there is no difference um, between these groups and there was a, um, and in 1947, 
still there is no difference. But between 1947 and 1950, the fertility decline happened nationwide, but the speed was faster for the district with uh, with uh, higher radio exposure. And so that implies already that this uh, empower women empowerment was really accelerating the, the uh, fertility transition. If not, it didn't trigger the fertility transition, but that really uh, accelerated the speed of it. And formally, I did again our um, regression analysis and in column three, I confirmed that there is no impact or statistically significant impact of radio subscription on the number of live births per 1,000 population in 1947. But looking at column six, we do find that when a district radio subscription increases by one standard deviation unit, then our number of live births per 1,000 population declined by um, 2.7. Um, you might ask me whether this was coming from the increase in abortions, because abortion was legalized uh, in, during this time period. And you might think that women with progressive ideas through radio may resort to abortions more. But at, at least by looking at the number of stillbirth, which is the sum of our natural prenatal death and abortions, I do not find any increase there. And if anything, um, if the radio exposure increases, the number of stillbirths decreases. So it's fair to say that this decline in the number of live births was coming from the family planning instead of abortions. Okay, so I'm approaching to the end of my talk. So fertility decline emerged. So um, and just to um, wrap, kind of summarize, one standard deviation increase in radio exposure really reduced the 1950 birth rate by 2.7 per, per 1,000 population. That accounts for rough, more than a bit half of the standard deviation of the birth rate in that time period. So it's not a crazy large number. Um, are, and we should be reminded that the fertility change was quite uh, substantial at the time. Also, because at the time, marriage pattern didn't really change in response to radio. Labor force participation also didn't change. So my results suggest that um, this uh, fertility change is, is just coming from the family planning preference for the number of children and kind of the acceptance of having fewer children uh, instead of other motivation like our career motivation or delayed marriage. And, and so really uh, my findings highlight that empowering women is also part of the story of Jap Japan's fertility transition. Okay. So um, I want to wrap up my talk. And so in this study, I examined the causal impact of being exposed to women's radio programs under allied occupation or women's political participation, employment, marriage, and fertility patterns. And I do find that uh, political participation immediately increased in response to the radio policy. Also fertility transition was accelerated a bit later in 1950. 
uh, but I didn't find any impact in the labor market or marriage pattern. And so my findings provide quantitative evidence that, um, first of all, this radio policy was effective. So this is consistent with what historians were talking about, um, but kind of give our quantitative support for that. And also this is um, one of the examples in the world that the public policy can kind of actively trying to challenge the existing patriarchal norms to, to try to push the, our gender equity in, in the society. Um, but uh, of course, looking at the current Japan's situation, maybe one time big push may not be enough. And there is a lot of work or research to be done uh, asking, for example, why then Japan didn't continue growing in terms of gender equity, but rather stuck at the kind of low state for a long time until our 80s and 90s. And with that, thank you so much for having me again. And I really look forward to the discussion phase. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Uh, and it was, it was very interesting and fascinating. So uh, we already have uh, you know, several, well, more than several questions on the Q&A queue. And I would like to sort of uh, group some questions into, uh, into a few sort of, you know, like a common, common topics. One is, so the first, um, I think the first group of questions are regarding mechanisms you are, um, you are sort of, uh, well, the mechanism in which the, the radio exposure uh, affects the, the, the several outcome variable, the turnout, uh, fertility, and other, and other things. So, and that's, that's actually, actually, I want to, uh, I want to ask the a question in, in, in the similar line, but let me read, uh, let, let me read the, the, the audience questions uh, in, in, in that group. So, uh, one is from Alison Alexi. Uh, thank you for this fascinating presentation. Could you share more of your thoughts about why radio in particular might have such a gendered effect? Uh, for instance, was radio more available to women than newspapers or other media? I was trying to imagine if it was possible for women to listen to radios privately or it is always shared with everyone in the house so that's that's one one of you know one of the questions i think regarding the the mechanisms um the um, another uh, uh another question is so uh from michael yamada could you explain how many japanese listened to radio as a whole in the post-war period and of which could you explain how many women did so regularly? Uh, did this trend change since? And if so, could you explain when and how? Um, there, there are some, uh, actually some other uh, questions regarding mechanisms, uh, which is, um, uh, well, uh, from Saki Kuzushima, could you please elaborate how women at this period listen to radio, which is similar to the question from Alison, I believe. Did they listen to it uh, individually at home or did they gather at some common place? Um, and uh, uh, so and the, the, the other, uh, so, well, other, another question is regarding the contents of the radio. Um, so uh, from Randy Kawakita, were the programs, talk shows, panels, uh, interviews, et cetera? Or were there any home drummers, soap operas? What time slot were they uh, aired? Um, and uh, uh, well, actually, there. <laughs> sorry, I think I, I maybe I'm I'm reading too many questions, but I hope you but can, maybe. Um, yeah, sure. So, These are really a wonderful question, and thank you so much. So yeah, can so, I answer and? Can, can I, I add? Can I add sort of um, on top of those of questions? So, 
you know, maybe maybe because I'm a political scientist, I'm I'm probably more skeptical about the effect of media in general on on political behavior of people. And I mean, you know, there there you know the the evidence, at least as far as I know, the evidence for the effect of media on people's behavior is is probably at the most mixed. I would say. I mean, in some cases you see the effect, and some in other cases you you don't see much effect. And especially at the individual level, evidence is is very mixed. Mm -hmm. I, I I would say, yeah. and I know you know maybe you know you you probably cited uh, you you probably cited this, but I know I know um, I know a study using a West German TV signal reception uh, as an instrumental variable, and and uh, tried to estimate the effect of that uh, ex effect of exposure to West German TV on East German political protest. And the effect was actually negative. Uh, that so basically, you know, those who watched West German TV in East Germany uh, tend to participate uh, political protests less likely. And so, you know, there, there is, there is all, you know, we, we, we kind of know like a lot of those sort of uh, mixed evidence of different directions and so on and so forth. And so I'm wondering, you know, in particular in this context, what mm -hmm. was the key uh, in the mechanism, I, I, I suppose, in the mechanism, what was the key for sort of getting the positive effect of, uh, mm -hmm. well, positive meaning that, you know, more exposure, more participation, like what, what, what determined this direction and, and the strength of the effect, mm -hmm. you, yeah. you think? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. And this is really important question. So let me answer to Yuki's question first before I, uh, I'm fresh. <laughs> while I'm fresh. So yes, there are, are other media papers, and I'm a little bit blanking that particular paper about the Western and Eastern Germany paper. Maybe I mixed up with others, but um, yes. So I think. A big difference between my context and other contexts that were studied was uh, there are two. One is that this was right after um, women's suffrage. So this was the first election for women. And of, of course, before that, there was a uh, women's suffrage movement. So it's not really, it's not really a case that women didn't know anything. But, but perhaps um, there is a huge jump uh, from the pre-war era where women are really not invited to vote, like they were excluded from, uh, from the politics to welcome to politics. And so this kind of background environmental factor is one of the key difference between um, my context and other papers. And I think that magnifies the effect of the media, but this is very contextual. And the other difference is, uh, is that basically when we think about the effect of media, we also, we, we need to understand what is their outside option or what was the alternatives from the listener's perspective. And that varies depending on the context. And in some papers, the outside option or alternative is watching, watching TV or other radio program or reading newspapers. And so there is some kind of like informational crowd out or, or uh, the radio effect really depends on what else the listeners did if they didn't listen to radio. And I think that really drives the difference between different papers. In this context, and I, this is gonna be related to the very first question, um, there was no other radio, like private radio shows. And also, at least in the very beginning of the, of the occupation, there was paper scarcity. So newspaper supply was limited. And that was at least according to GHQ's cap radio section, 
that was the exact reason why they really pushed radio, like they really invested in radio shows to reach out people. And so it's like, in this context, outside option is not to listen to or not to expose to any media. And I think that really causes the, um, as you said, positive uh, or significant effect. And, and so that's my working hypothesis. I'd love to hear your thought. And this is exactly what we have to be careful when extend my or generalize my findings to other contexts. And okay, oh, I had other questions. So mechanism, um, I'm not sure if I can answer all of them, but tr let me try to show you one, uh, one survey result that I found in the archive. Uh, I hope that you can see it. So this is um, program rating during the daytime hours. Uh, Monday, Friday average. So, well, I don't, I didn't write. So this was a particular week of, I think, 1940s, nine or eight, but I, uh, excuse me, I, I didn't write it here. So basically there was one channel during the day. So this timeline corresponds to the program because there was one program per time slot. And basically, this is the percentage of men on the left and women on the right. And what, 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 what were the percentage of them listening to uh, this um, radio in this particular day, week? And, and so the pink um, and the pink ones were for women's programs and the others were like music, news and weather forecast. Uh, what's interesting is that, um, so one takeaway is that the major, this um, pink big box is between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. that are for women's hour. And this was st strategically placed during this time window because this is the lunch time for farmers' wives and, and for other, other or, or housewives. And, and so in that case, I think women were able to listen to radio at home uh, without really worrying about other family members or, or something like that. So that's what I know, what, what I can tell from the survey. Although this is a particular week, and I cannot really judge whether this was a particularly um, high listenership week or low listenership week, unfortunately. Um, I hope that somehow answers to some questions and I'd love to hear follow-up questions if any. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, I think uh, that that would be that would be kind of an interesting uh, interesting answer to uh, those to the mechanism kind of question. Uh, so relatedly, there are some questions about the uh, the differential effect of radio exposure on on different outcomes, in particular sort of participation and fertility rate, and uh, on labor and marriage. Uh, market results. So one 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 like direct question about that is uh, from Saki Kubushima. Do you have a hypothesis about why radio was effective on public, political participation and fertility rate, but uh, not on labor or marriage market? Does it match the pattern of the content uh, broadcasted? Uh, uh, from Nuan Nuan Shan, uh, thanks for the super interesting presentation. Could you offer some insights on why the effect of radio program seems uh, transient, at least on the dimension of political participation? I ask because the first figure shows the percentage of uh, women see decline quickly after the uh, occupation. It seems that the content about the politics decline over time. Could this be one of the reasons? Uh, oh, okay, sorry, this is this is actually a different topic. Um, the, uh, well, another question from Char Charlie McLean. Uh, 
Uh, thank you for the great uh, presentation. I was wondering if you could speak more about why you think uh, why you think you find significant effects on women's radio programs on political participation and fertility decisions, but not labor uh, market participation and marriage. Uh, so that's uh, sorry. Uh, I think I <laughs> I picked up a, a one sort of not super related question, but if you could answer both of those, uh, that would be great. Yes, yes. So the for the labor market outcome um, and marriage. So my working hypothesis, although I cannot test it in this particular context, is the way how they broadcasted these programs. Basically, um, they were targeting women listeners, and really the programs were not expected to be listened by men. And so, for example, in the labor market, I cannot see, so, so the labor market participation is a kind of an equilibrium outcome between the labor supply, uh, their women, and the labor demand that are employers. And, and employers are heavily male dominated at the time. Um, I mean, on, on top of that, men came back from, from the battlefields and that's another story. And so my take is that even though women changes like their, in, their intention to work, if the demand side didn't change, then that, that's not going to be uh, an observed outcomes in the labor market. And, and I mentioned this because there, there is also a kind of not similar, but um, other informational intervention actually in Sweden, which was also trying to promote gender equity in 1960s, a bit later than this context. And that uh, state TV was actually targeting both men and women. And they were targeting the couples um, and the, the, the TV show was supposed to be watched by a couple in the evening time, like uh, at the dinner table or something. And so I wondered if Japan did that kind of different approach to disseminate idea, that shifted the other half of the population and we may saw our other effects. But um, this is a th thought experiment because it didn't happen in Japan, but uh, that was my uh, one of the hypotheses. But maybe because they didn't really approach to men, we didn't see any backfire or a direct backrush from men like, oh, I hate this program or something like that. Um, so that's one, my insight, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. And so I, I was too excited to answer this question. So um, <laughs> the other question, um, why, uh, so, so yes, the, um, transient effect of radio. So its effect wasn't really going away. I was a bit shying away from this uh, result. So this is the women's turnout in 46, 49, and 52. I don't have data for 47, unfortunately. Um, this is showing, so I spread the sample into two groups radio high exposure group and low exposure group and the difference between the two groups here in the 1946 is is basically what i showed you in the, in the regression you can see that both in the high exposure group and low exposure group turnout is increasing and actually converging and it's kind of it's it's i say a spillover of the initial treatment from the treatment group to the control group, if I allow to use statistic lingo. And so statistically, um, this is a contamination. So I didn't show, um, this is not a clean causal analysis, but at the background, I collected newspapers on what was going on. And basically there was a name and shame 
for the districts where the women's turnout was very low in the very first election. And there are more women mobilization efforts after 46 election when the in the districts uh, where they had low women's turnout. And I think that caused a catch up. So it's an interesting um, dynamic interaction uh, and like a snowball effect that the, the first intervention really triggers and, and spreads around the nation. Um, this is a bit beyond my uh, analytical framework, but our, this is definitely interesting for me, how we started in, in eventually women's uh, turnout catch, uh, caught up with men's turnout. So yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, so there is another, well, there are another group of questions about uh, empirical <laughs> strategy from, uh, you know, I think some of the audience are kind of a, uh, have a technical knowledge. So one, one of those is uh, from uh, Fumia Uchikoshi. Uh, it seems uh, towns with a high radio exposure are clustered in urban areas. Are there any spillover effects of the geographical clustering on your outcome? For example, political participation or fertility. Uh, another is from uh, Shinobu Kitayama. Uh, the method is very, very interesting, uh, but one worry uh, could be that the strength of the radio signal might index various third variables, including how rural and uh, thus conservative supportive of the traditional gender roles, the locations were. Uh, conservative regions might have been both less likely to subscribe to the radio show uh, and more likely to show behaviors consistent with more traditional gender roles. Is this a concern? And if so, uh, how can your uh, instrumental uh, variable regression address the problem? Uh, another question from Komo uh, Yuri, uh, Komo Yuki, is there any factor you considered that affect both the number of birth and the women's radio exposure? I think uh, uh, the, the problem could be uh, there, there is a, there is a confound, confounder on affecting the uh, both uh, uh, field strength and, uh, and uh, 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 fertility. I believe because that's a, that's an instrumental variable, like uh, exogeneity of instrumental variable assumption would be violated if, if such a confounder exists. Uh, and uh, there, there's uh, one final thing, which is uh, about sort of the incumbency advantage, maybe another sort of possible confounder. Uh, so uh, from a question from Atsushi Yamagishi, do the incumbency advantage matter here? After the war, I believe many incumbent politicians got purged, Koshok Tsuiho, and all women candidates were new challengers. Uh, well, of course, they couldn't participate in the elections. Yep. So implying that uh, the presence of women, like uh, women candidates, was a larger in districts with more extensive purging. And these radio listenership or, or uh, field strength or your IV variation in it correlated with the existence of strong incumbents in an electoral district. Yes, um, thank you so much. So this is a great group of uh, technical questions. So let me be technical a little bit. Um, about the incumbency effect, or, or maybe, no, I let me go back to the first question. Maybe that's the, the easier order. So, I hope I address uh, some of your concerns. So this is the illustration of how my IV exactly works. And so, uh, so the radio subscription is an um, independent variable and my field strength or denkai kyodo in, in Japanese is an IV or instrumental variable. And um, so based on engineering or physics, uh, electronic engineering. This field strength is determined by four factors, and that's known, and that are distance to the transmitter, 
output frequency and output power and ground conditions. That's what I called um, uh, uh, soil conditions in my in my presentation. And I did worry about that are some radio transmitters, not everything, were in the in the city. And, and so basically distance captures uh, how, how progressive people are, progressive gender norms and so forth. So um, I definitely wanted to com control for this and I should really eliminate variation in field strength coming from the distance. Also, well, I mean, I didn't find any narratives, but in theory, allied powers could put a larger pow output power, for example, if they, if a particular location was of their interest. So, okay, I, I had to, I control for that. And so really the remaining variation in field strength is coming from the ground conditions. And um, so the remaining wall is that, for example, the soil condition, that, that is basically what uh, moisture content and salt content of the ground between the transmitter and, and our potential receiver. So it's, it's like all the soils between these two points. Um, if they are correlated with our fertility capacity, then I will be worried. Um, I, at my capacity, I Googled all the scientific evidence. I didn't find it. But of course, no evidence, it doesn't mean that I deny that fact, but that's, that's the best thing that I could do. And also I checked whether this ground condition is correlated with the agricultural productivity proxied by the share of agricultural uh, labor force. And that, that was the best thing that I could do. And I didn't find any correlation. And so that's my defense for the IV. And so that was the, uh, um, and, and okay. Uh, incumbency effects or am I skipping a question? But let me talk about incumbent. So, it's true. So we had 79 female candidates in this election. Um, I didn't, at least a correlation level, I didn't find any um, correlation between women candidacy and radio exposure. Uh, of course, in, in an ideal world, I wanted to have their address and where they were exactly and whether they were listening to radio, but that was impossible to, to correct, uh, to see. So I, I had to kind of aggregate up at the, at the prefecture level. Um, so I, and again, my identification is coming from this, uh, really the variation from the ground conditions. So if, if that, is, that was correlated with the women candidacy, then that's a problem. But I couldn't find any convincing narratives that that was the case. Um, and so that was my... Uh, best answer that I could make at this moment. Um, sorry, Yuki, was there any other question? Um, I think uh, I think you answered, I, I think you basically answered all questions. I think in particular, okay. uh, you know, clarification about the ground condition is super helpful because, okay. and, and I, I, you know, and, and so you, you controlled, you controlled for the distance from the, uh, from the station. So that's, yep. that's another, that's another sort of helpful answer because that would, that would probably control, I mean, you know, uh, more or less control for the urban and rural uh, difference, and uh, you know, if you if you check the ground condition, has has no sort of relationship or correlation between the agricultural productivity. That that would, that would probably helps as well because you know, I guess the people people would worry about 
you know, okay, so the radio, you know, radio, uh, well, field strength is correlated with like, you know, more agriculture or less agricultural um, villages and things like that. But those, you know, you'd, you'd, imagine, you'd expect that uh, more agricultural places uh, probably involves more sort of traditional uh, gender roles. So that's, sure. that's, that's probably, you know, people's yeah. uh, strong, strongest worry. But, you know, if you, if you address that by that way, um, I think that would be, uh, yeah. that, would, that would sort of basically answer the question. Okay, thank great. You. Well, uh, thank, thank you for the question. I didn't really go into the details, so thank you for the chance <laughs> to clarify this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, well, we still have a few questions. Um, uh, uh, you know, a few about uh, sort of like a details of like radio itself, radio programs itself. I think. Uh, so from uh, from Michael Yamada, uh, I suppose the language on radio was Japanese. Uh, was Tokyo Rose uh, Miss Miss Toguri from Chicago in this effort? That's that's a very kind of a specific question about the radio, and I don't know if you have answered to this question. But uh, there are some others. So uh, you know, you you uh, from uh, from Basumar. Arshad, uh, you mentioned that the original content was written in English. Were the programs delivered in English as well or translated into Japanese? How did the translation process work? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, thank you for asking. And uh, let me clarify that, uh, first of all, what I showed you in my presentation was a radio report, which was a summary of the radio content every day written in English, but that wasn't the exact transcript. transcript. And, and transcript was in Japanese and written in Japanese, uh, checked by SCAP two weeks before it's on air. And I don't exactly know how it worked, but it seems that they, the radio unit had a translator. So somehow they translated into English. They got a comment and translated back to Japanese and, and uh, revised it. And that was the process, I think. Um, and this is this language. And, and also there are, in the beginning, all the production was ha happened in Tokyo, but later, um, some interview uh, in interview sections. Oh, I I got this question earlier. So there were like interviews, and uh, other soap, not soap opera, but a kind of a show, small show. And that was a mixture. And really, they mixed different types of um, formats in order to keep listeners' attention. And, and that's, that's in the record. And uh, so later in the occupation, they also kind of recorded it in Osaka to, to really record Kansai Ben. And, and so there were, there seemed to be some variation in the language, in, in, in the dialect. Um, and, and that was for first question. And, sorry. Um, okay, well, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, there is another question about the topics of the, of the radio. So from Michael Yamada, it is interesting the program's topics shifted from politics in 1946 to food in 1950. Was it a necessary transition or more political manipulation at that time? And I actually had the same question. Uh, you know, I, well, I, I checked the, the election schedule because maybe, maybe whether there is an election in particular year may affect the, the topics, but it turned out like, uh, between 1945 and 1950, like Japan had election almost every year. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, so I'm I'm also curious the same uh, same same question actually. So my reading of why political topics 
lost their weight in the radio shows was because of the um, Korean War and 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 it seems that at least in within the radio unit at SCAP radio section or radio unit and especially among women officers they were trying not to be political and this is something maybe i need some political scientists insights but i think it has some also something to do with the um um i don't want to say something wrong but some the kind of rising power of left or, or mm. like w some women uh voters are, are are voting for more left left leaning parties and i think it has something to do with it and they have our own incentive not to appear to be political, but more married or children and try to be politically neutral. And that's my reading of the document. Um, and so it, I don't think it, it's directly related to the polit uh, political cycle or election cycle, more about the external pressure. Out, from outside of Japan. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, so actually there is, I think, a follow-up question about the technical issue, uh, which is from uh, Atsushi Yamagishi. Uh, sorry I, if I missed it during the presentation, but are you controlling for a proxy of the average income of each municipality? Uh, even if ground conditions are exogenously determined, people might endogenously make migration decisions according to such conditions. Since the richest tend to be more progressive, I am especially a bit worried that income level is endogenously better in areas with better ground conditions that facilitate radio reception. Um, I think, uh, well, um, yeah, well, I guess, I'm not sure if the, the richer tend to be more progressive applies to that, that particular period of Japan, but, uh, but I guess the, the, the spirit of the question applies to. Yeah, also. sure. Yeah, yeah. So um, in a short answer, I don't have a me good measurement for income. And that's why I'm controlling for the industrial composition, uh, household density, which is the urbanness. Also, I have an indicator valuable for she uh, versus gun and um, what else and I also control for um, pre-war outcomes if available like for fertility pre-war fertility so so in that sense um, if there is something persistent in the area I was trying to uh, control for that. And so the ground condition or soil condition, that matters not only for your own location, but between a transmitter and you. And it's pretty complicated. And so if listeners knew that where is really the best place then they might have migrated uh i th but i don't think that's uh, way too much of a calculation uh but but i see the spirit like um it uh, it would have been better if i have a direct income measurement and and but uh, that's the kind of uh, data didn't allow me to control for that yeah well uh you know, we don't we don't live in the ideal world, so oftentimes we can't find the good data to use. So I totally I totally get it. Um, 
Uh, there is one remaining question. I think this uh, this came up during your presentation, and maybe maybe it is it is answered in a uh, later part of your presentation. But I I just in case I read out. Uh, so from Michael Yamada, I didn't understand men's outcomes as pl placebo. Could you explain what men's outcome were there? Maybe oh, you can yes. revisit yes. Uh, that part of your presentation. Yes, so uh, particularly for turnout, where I see a positive impact on uh, women's turnout. Um, I also had men's turnout, for which I didn't have, I didn't have a statistically significant effect of the radio exposure on men's outcome. And that is important um, because I know that based on the survey, that men really didn't listen to women's programs. And so uh, that kind of serves as not the best, but uh, second best placebo for um, women's outcomes. Well, for fertility, it's difficult because that requires uh, both. Um, men and women um and so there would have been some spillover within the household which i really wanted to get at but um since i didn't have an individual level data it is a bit difficult to um, address but that's that's a really uh, good question then and thank you for the thank you for asking great i think we are about time uh so i will uh oh uh okay well i mean i'm i'm allowed to <laughs> i'm allowed to ask one last question so maybe uh maybe uh, uh one one sort of one one kind of a broad question you it, not necessarily you can you can answer out of your research itself but so uh, you know you you started your talk uh, with showing uh, you know showing the proportion of female legislators in Japan and other countries and the comparison you know by comparison of, of course it's um, you know the Japan is very lagging behind uh, but the you know the outcome you are talking about is uh, mostly on the border side the turnout uh, and a political political uh, outcome variable is is border side the turnout which is not necessarily directly related to you know uh, like on politician side like whether whether women uh, legislator run for offices uh, well women candidates run for offices and whether they are elected so what would be um you know what what would what what could you sort of speak about the relationship between the two so whether whether do we do we have higher turnout from from uh female voters are we going to have more uh, women legislators that it seems that that's not happening in Japan and what what uh, you know uh, what can change that situation what could change that situation in your opinion yes so that's a very uh, good question asking the mechanism behind why what female candidate gain more vote in the areas with greater radio exposure um, that I briefly showed in my presentation. And I did some back of the envelope calculation and that's why I showed uh, kind of mot to motivate, I showed percentage women in the, in the parliament. Um, but the remaining question that I could not answer was that, was this effect coming from the, um, external mar like extensive margin in, in the statistical lingo so is was this increased women female voters or turnout women's turnout were going to female politicians or it's 
the effect is actually coming from the intensive margin, meaning that women who voted anyway, but now because they were more exposed to radio, they kind of um, change their choice. Like, oh, okay, maybe I don't follow my husband and I'm gonna vote for female candidate. This extensive versus intensive margins are, are still, um, I, I cannot answer this question because we don't know who voted for, for whom. And um, so, and, 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 um, and it's a bit difficult to compare today's situation and back then, especially I need to then measure like the distance between each candidate's platform and how different male candidates and the female candidates are, how, how, how different they were. In my sense, although I can be wrong because I didn't quantify that in that election, women's platforms were really different from what men, male candidates had. And maybe that gave an option for women voters uh, for whom they wanted to vote. Um, but that's definitely, I need some evidence to, to speak about this. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, uh, well, everyone virtually, so join me uh, thanking Professor Yoko Okuyama. And, and uh, that's, Thank you this, so is much. The, this is the end of today's lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.